Our story began in 1993 when my husband and I decided to have our first baby. We found out we were pregnant and we were both very, very excited. I have a degree in child development and so I've always wanted to have children. So on May 14, 1993 when Brandon was born, that was the happiest day of my life. He looked like a normal baby, like all babies do when they're born. He had 10 fingers and 10 toes and he was pink and, and healthy looking. And we took him home from the hospital and everything seemed fine. Um, for the first five months, we did what most parents do. We took him to the mall, we took him uh, over to visit relatives, we even took him on his first airplane. However, at the age of about six months, he came down with what we thought was his first cold. Um, we didn't want to be overreactive parents, so we just kind of kept a close eye on him. And, but he seemed to really be struggling, so we decided it was time to take him to the doctor. And my husband went with me, and when we took him to the doctor, the pediatrician said, babies that are really sick won't smile. And Brandon smiled at my husband while we were there at the visit. He said, I don't think there's anything really wrong with him. So we took him back home, and over the weekend, he really seemed to get lethargic, and he really wasn't eating well wasn't sleeping well and so we decided we really needed to take him back again. However, this time we came um, being more forceful and we said to the doctor, we just really had this gut feeling that there's something not right with him and we're insisting that you please send us to the hospital to have blood drawn. So the pediatrician complied and we went to the hospital. As soon as we walked in the door, the nurses took one look at him and they could tell that something was seriously wrong. His lips were blue, his fingernails were blue, and from that moment on, he went on oxygen. As the days passed by, the doctors struggled to try to figure out what was wrong with him as he got worse and worse and transferred from hospital to hospital with still no answers. He ended up with 13 blood transfusions. He was put on a ventilator. He ended up on a life support machine, ECMO, which is a heart-lung bypass machine before the doctors finally decided to do a skin biopsy to try and figure out what it was that was making him so sick. Uh, when, the, when the biopsy came back, the results came back, um, we were shocked to learn that what they thought he had was SCID, Severe Combined Immune Deficiency. Now I had seen the movie uh, with John Travolta, The Boy in the Plastic Bubble, but I had no idea. Um, you know, and I remember David Vedder li that lived the real story of David Vetter and how he lived in his bubble for 12 years, but I had no idea what kind of an impact this disease was going to have on our lives. At this point, the doctors told us there really was nothing else that they could do for Brandon, um, that the chance of survival was skid. He was so sick he couldn't have a bone marrow transplant. There was nothing else they could do, and they told us that they were going to need to turn the machines off. We brought all of our family in that weekend and, and said goodbye to him and, and did a lot of praying and hoped for a miracle, but unfortunately our miracle didn't come. And on that Monday we had to turn off the machines. And although it's been... over 16 years, I remember it, I remember it like it was yesterday. That's the hardest thing a parent will ever have to do. And nothing in life can ever prepare you for that. At three and a half months after Brandon's death, the autopsy results came back, and it was at that time that the doctors were able to confirm to us that Brandon had passed away from skid. At six months later, I found out that I was a carrier of this disease, which I really had a hard time believing because there was no family history. Unfortunately, that's what happens with families a lot of times, is they have to lose a child before they can save another child, because there isn't family history. Um, I was a child development teacher, and it was just too painful me, for me to go back and be around children, so I used this time to educate myself and to learn as much about SCID as I could. Uh, about a year after Brandon's death, we decided we wanted to try again for another child. I was so excited when I found out I was pregnant, and at 10 weeks, we decided to have a CVS test done. The next day, the results came back. We had a one in four chance of the next pregnancy being affected, and we found out the next day that it was a boy. All of a sudden, our odds went from one in four to 50-50. Three weeks later, we found out the devastating news that our next child was also going to be affected with skid. That was the longest three weeks of my life, as you can imagine, trying to wait for those results. 
At that point, we knew that the only treatment for X-linked skid was a bone marrow transplant, and we had done our research on it, and we knew that if we did it within the first three months of life, that our new baby would have a great chance of surviving. However, we met with a doctor who told us that he would like to do bone marrow transplant in utero, and we actually liked the idea of that. Um, we thought this was sort of a plan A and a plan B. If it, if it worked, great. If it didn't work, we would do the traditional bone marrow transplant after birth. So at 16, 17 and a half, and 18 and a half weeks gestation, we did the transplant, and uh, actually the baby's father was the donor. We had the rest of the pregnancy to go with just wondering and waiting to see whether it had worked or not. At 36 weeks uh, was the second happiest day of my life, and that was when Taylor was born. He again looked just like his brother at birth. Pink, healthy, 10 fingers, 10 toes, they looked so much alike. But then Brandon looked normal at birth too, so it really, you know, it really was a scary thing. Um, but immediately the doctors did, test, uh, did blood work on his cord blood and found out that it appeared to look like Taylor had the functioning immune system that his father had donated to him. Of course, the true test would be when he would come down with his first cold. At six or seven months of age, uh, we started to worry. Um, I took Taylor to the doctor about every other day to keep a close eye on him, but he did beautifully. He is just the picture of health. He's had um, colds, he's had flus, he's had pneumonias. He's gotten over that without any problems. He seems to have a, a great functioning immune system, and I'm happy to say that he's a teenager now, that he's in high school, he's on the honor roll, and he even drives. <laughs> And um, luckily for us, he is just the, the light of our life and the joy of our lives. The story of my two sons and their dramatically different outcomes clearly illustrates why newborn screening for SCID is so important. Unfortunately, Brandon didn't have a chance at life, and Taylor did, and it was because we knew to look for this disease that he had a chance. Early detection is so important. For families without a family history, mandatory screening for these babies at birth is what we need to see happen. It is our goal to see that SCID is no longer considered a pediatric emergency and newborn screening for this disease is implemented in every state. Please help us make SCID newborn screening universal so no more babies have to die from this curable disease.